gentlemen, coming to you from the Spit Studios in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. This is the Spit Sports Show. Now, usually, I like to start out these shows by telling you how my weekend of sports watching went. Um, but if you've been keeping up with the show or anything like that, you would know that it went absolutely awful. Everything went wrong. Um, the Lions got smoked by the Baltimore Ravens, which I'll touch on briefly at the end, maybe. Um, my fantasy team lost to a guy who talks so much crap and has nothing to back it up except, of course, this week his kicker puts up 22 and his Patrick. Anyways, it wasn't great, but which is, <laughs> which is why I'm so thankful that tonight I have another sport that I can just watch and consume and, you know, take some of my feelings away from the football season. And that is the NBA season is starting up tonight. Now, I am so excited coming into this NBA season, but for, not for the reasons you might expect. Um, first of all, I think coming into this season, the MVP is as easy to predict as it's ever been before. We have that coming up later in the show. But I want to start with somehow the most popular team in the NBA with the most popular player in the NBA on the team in the second largest city in the NBA somehow is the most underrated to win the title considering what they have. Yes, I am talking about the Los Angeles Lakers. So coming into this year, the Lakers have three elements. They have their new signings. They have their old players that are, or not old players, but players they had last season that are starting to develop, and they have their two superstars. So let's look at those step by step. So first of all, they signed Gabe Vincent and Christian Wood. They signed a bunch of other guys too, but realistically, those are the only two that are going to be consistently in the lineup. So let's start with Gabe Vincent. This guy, if you watched the Miami Heat at all last year, you would know that Gabe Vincent embodies that Heat culture that they pushed so hard and that carried them to the finals last year. This guy is a big time shot taker and a big time shot maker. And you always know in the playoffs, especially when a guy wants the ball in his hands or not, you know what I mean? Just by his body language, if he's got, you know, he's got his hands up constantly yelling for the ball, or he's just, you know, a little slumped in the corner or, you know, it, you can tell a lot just by watching the players and how they, you know, react and interact with their teammates when the balls and in, in on the offensive end. It seemed to me like Gabe Vincent wanted the ball every single time the heat came down the court in big, big moments. Like, the Lakers' main issue last year was playoff shooting because D'Angelo Russell fell off so bad and Malik Beasley had an awful, awful shooting slump that even led into the regular season. But Gabe Vincent is a proven playoff shooter. He can guard small guards, shifty guards pretty well. And overall, he's just a really, really good addition to the Lakers' backcourt, which is probably their weakest aspect. But going into their front court. Christian Wood. Now, I watched this guy a lot when he was on the Mavericks because I love Luka, and I love watching Luka play. And his issue on the Mavericks and even on the Rockets before that was always defense. But on the Mavericks, Mavericks especially, they used him completely wrong on defense because the Mavericks play so freaking small. Like, their tallest player, biggest player is Dwight Powell, who is six foot ten on a good day. Christian Wood, when he was out there and Powell wasn't, had to guard centers. He had to guard Andre Drummond's and Joel Embiid type bodies. When he's only 6'9 and as he's just rail thin, he is not meant or built to guard these bigger centers, which is what he was assigned to do. If you put him on a power forward, which is what's going to happen on the Lakers with Anthony Davis taking the assignments of these bigs, I think he's going to be a lot more impactful on defense. Is he going to be above average is he going to be a great defender no but he brings enough offensively to make up for that like offensively this guy can really do it all like good three-point shooter solid from the mid-range he's great off pick and roll like he can do a lot of things really well that the lakers other guys can't really do all that well like they don't really have a stretch for except for hachimura when he went on that crazy shooting streak but i don't expect him to shoot 40 percent from three, you know, throughout the entire season. And speaking of Rui Hachimura, him and Austin Reeves, I think it would surprise you to know, are only 25 years old each. So the NBA prime is usually anywhere from 27 
is from when you're 27 to about 33. That's like the prime of your career. So these guys still have a couple more years to get better. And Hachimura, man, like if all of the stories are true with how much he's been in the gym with LeBron and how much effort he's been putting into this offseason, like I only expect him to get better. And he's only gotten better since he's been on the Lakers. Like I said, he went on an unbelievable shooting streak in the playoffs where he shot darn near 40%, if not over that. And also just his interior presence has been got, has gotten so much better. Like, the, is he now has the ability to post up and throw a, uh, throw a little baby hook, or he's able to get to the rim nowadays. Like, he can really do it all. And he's a solid defender, big body. And Austin Reeves, man, like, I know looking at him, it's hard to think of him as the third best player on a title team. But, like, he might be, and he almost was last year. Like, during those playoffs... Every single series, it felt like he was hitting a, a big three in a tight game. You know what I mean? Especially against the Grizzlies. He killed the Grizzlies. Like, he had the Grizzlies had him walking down the court, pointing to himself, saying, I'm him. Like, in the most cringy way I've ever seen in my life. But he was saying it. Like, this guy has unbelievable confidence coming into this year, or at least he should, considering the playoff run he had. And he's just so crafty with his scoring. Like, you're telling me he couldn't average like 20, 21 a game? Behind LeBron's probably 25 and AD's 27. Like, that is more than enough scoring from your top three guys. And he'll never be the best defender just because he's athletically limited, but he tries. He You can't say he doesn't try. Like, it, my comparison for him is Luka, not just because he's white, but because, like, they're both kind of, you know, unathletic guys that you don't expect much from, but they're quicker than you think and a little stronger than you think on offense. But Luka doesn't really try on defense. Reeves will give you his full effort. Like, against Steph Curry last year, like he was running around trying to keep up with his off-ball stuff. Gave, gives you everything he's got. And before I talk about the two superstars of the Lakers, which are probably their biggest question mark, I want to talk about their competition, which in the West is obviously Denver, who swept them last year. But... I think that word swept is deceiving when it comes to that series because three out of the four games were within six points. And if you watch that series, there were about like 10 shots that I can remember where a defender was just draped all over someone with the shot clock winding down. They have no dribble. This is Jokic, Murray, or somebody just draped all over them. They throw up a heave and somehow would just like bank in. And you know what? Credit to the Nuggets for making those shots, I guess. But, like, those aren't shots you practice. They're shots that just randomly go in. If a couple of those shots go the other way, or maybe the Lakers make a couple of those, like, that series could flip very quickly. It wasn't like the Nuggets were all over the Lakers or blowing them out every game. Three out of the four were very, very close, coming down to the last couple of possessions. And the Nuggets... I know like the media narrative is they brought everybody back, but they didn't. They lost Bruce Brown. And when the Nuggets run an eight-man lineup, seven-man lineup, like every single player is super important to that team's chemistry. And Bruce Brown, what he could do was come in off the bench and provide just such a quick scoring plug when Murray and Jokic needed a break because obviously they can't be 100% all the time on offense, right? So you could give the ball to Bruce Brown, let him ISO for a couple plays. He'll probably get you 15 to 20 points, and you're good to go. He could also defend, you know, bigger guards. He was big body. He could move pretty well. Like, that's a big loss for them. He's on the Pacers now. And when you play against a Lakers team that has an Austin Reeves or a Hachimura or even D'Angelo Russell, who's a bigger guard, like, Bruce Brown, he was the, he was the one guarding those guys a lot. They're missing him now, which brings me to the Lakers' top two guys, which no one can guard, but it's just a matter of health for these two, and in one case, age. So LeBron's going into year 21, and what he's expected to do is unheard of. Because, listen, I looked up year 21, best seasons ever, and I was just amazed. So... The most points per game put up in year 21 is 7.4 by Vince Carter. Next is 7.3 by Dirk Nowitzki. 
and then it drops to 3.7 by my boy Robert Parrish. LeBron's expected to triple that, and not just expected to. If he doesn't, it's a disappointing season in the eyes of pretty much every NBA fan. Like, he's expected to be anywhere from 25 to 27 a game. If you triple 7.4, that's 23. He's expected to do something that no one's ever done before. But the thing is, when it comes to LeBron, unheard of, never done before, like, these are all just kind of words to me. Like, when you have a a once-in-a-lifetime athlete, like LeBron is, you just don't bet against him when it comes to especially durability and availability and taking care of his body and committing to the process. Like, his first 17 years in the league, he didn't have a significant injury. He was playing 70-plus every single year, and I get that he's older now, and he's way more prone to being injured. But I never have a sliver of doubt that he's doing everything in his power to keep his body at the best possible shape and be in the best possible condition to win NBA games because he's been here so long. He knows how to do it. And his talent, his will factor, his clutch factor, all of that is a lot on a team. And Anthony Davis, man, when he's healthy, like for as much of a roller coaster as he is offensively, because he goes from 30 a night to 12. He is up and down. Every single game, he's going to be a top three defender in the NBA. And on most games, he's going to be the best. The best rim protector for sure. I know Jaron Jackson won Defensive Player of the Year, but I watched those two play against each other, and it was not close on defense. This Lakers team has all the talent. I believe in their coach, Darvin Ham. I think LeBron is on a mission to get a title in year 21 as the second best player, which would just be a feat that, would be hard to put into context in the grand scheme of NBA history because like the oldest somebody has led a team to a championship was maybe Kobe at 35. I think Jordan was 34 for his last title. Um, there it, It's a short list and he would be at the very top of that short list of old guys to lead a team to a championship. And his would be just unprecedented so like I said coming into this um the MVP this year to me is really easy to predict um because everything is coming up perfectly for this individual and that is Joel Embiid listen the only positive of James Harden being let's use the word aloof for the Sixers organization because of what he's going through with Daryl Morey it lines up perfectly for Joel Embiid to win the MVP because The roster around him, look, Tyrese Maxey is perfect to be good enough to be the second best player on a really good regular season team, like 50 plus wins, but he's not good enough to be the second best player on a championship team yet. He might be because he seems to only get better. And I really like Tyrese Maxey as a player, but for now, he's the second best player on a good regular season team, but not the second best player on a championship. And what that means is, when Embiid averages 33, 15, and 5 on a 50-plus win Sixers team without another superstar, it's going to be tough to take that MVP away from him because the other guys who are competing for the MVP, you know, Giannis, he's got Lillard now. So that kind of takes some value away from him because you got another superstar shooter on your team. Jokic has Murray, who's now a proven playoff performer and has maybe the most cohesive roster in basketball around him. Luka... I'd love to pick Luke and win the MVP, but until he proves to me that his style can win 60-ish games, 50-plus consistently, and also him and Kyrie was a flat-out disaster last year, I expect it to be better, but not good enough for Luke to win an MVP. Like, it seems like everything's coming up Embiid right now, to be totally honest. And I think he's the third pick to win the MVP right now in Vegas. I think that's a pretty good bet. I think MVP, or I think MVP, I think Embiid runs away with the MVP this season. I don't even think it's going to be close. Also, if you look at the history of it, Giannis, Jokic, and Embiid, those are the three, you know, big European superstars right now, like big guys. I know Luke is there, but he's kind of in a different discussion. And they might be the three best players in basketball. If you want to put Steph in there, I get it. But those three guys, 
Giannis won back to back 19 20. Jokic won 21 22. And Bede won last year. It seems like if the if history is going to show us anything, it's that Embiid's going to win back to back to match those guys in MVPs. Because I think he's just as good as they are individually. Probably not, you know, as a team player, but individually, statistics, MVP kind of conversation, he's just as good as those guys are. So I want to talk a little bit of football before this uh, the end of the show, and I'm going to stay in Philadelphia in Philadelphia because after watching the Minnesota. Niners game last night I am convinced that Philly is on their own team in the NFC and then the Lions and the Niners are a tier below that and the Cowboys and the Seahawks are like Philly's one hole on their roster that I could see was their secondary because it seemed like every time they would play a good quarterback they'd get smoked like Goff put up 300 on him Dak put up 250 plus twice last year um Rogers cooked them like Their secondary was gettable if you could block their front four for long enough. Now they're adding Kevin Byard, which, first of all, Titans, shame on you for making Philadelphia this juggernaut because you gave them A.J. Brown for pennies on the dollar, and now you're giving them Kevin Byard for, what, a fourth and something else? Like, oh my gosh, it makes me sick. As rooting for another team in the NFC who's a contender, it makes me sick that the Eagles were able to get this guy for so cheap because... I don't know if you guys grind pro football focus safety rankings and stats like I do, but this guy is undisputedly a top 10 safety in the league, if not top five. Anywhere from between four and five interceptions a year, he's great in zone. He's good at robber. He's a solid free safety. Like He just kind of does it all. And adding that to an Eagle secondary that already has Darius Slay in it means that secondary, on paper, it sure as heck not a weakness anymore which is so unfortunate for the Niners, especially because Ayuk and Debo, it was going to be really, really tough for Philly secondary to guard that because their safeties were below average, but now they're not. Man, Howie Roseman, I, I, I'm amazed he hasn't won executive of the year more often. This guy just makes moves, and especially with the 49ers now, like with their guys getting beat up and them playing such a physical style of football, it's hard for me to say they're going to be completely healthy when they end up playing Philly in the playoffs, if they do. You know what I mean? So Philly's obviously the favorite in the NFC. I think they're a tier above the other teams. Um, And that brotherly shove play, people have been asking me what I think is going to happen with it. They're going to ban it. Like, the NFL at the end of the day is no different than movies and TV shows. It's a entertainment product. And their goal is to be as entertaining as possible to the viewer. That play is ugly, that play is no fun, that play is a guarantee, it takes away all tension, and like they're going to get to the point where they get so good at it, they can get two, three yards every play, and they can just kill the clock for you know six minutes if they have to. If they can start getting three yards a play, oh my goodness gracious me, it'd be over. So they're going to ban it just based off entertainment purposes, which I'm totally for. I hope they ban it mid-season, because I feel like we the Lions might see the Eagles in the playoffs, and Obviously, if they're at the one yard line or it's a third and one, we just there's nothing you can do unless you pull uh, Fred Warner and just jump over the pile and toss him, which only maybe five guys in the NFL can do. Maybe Hutchinson can do it, but I don't know. Um, I'm not going to talk about the Lions Ravens blowout. Um, We didn't play well. I'm already long enough into this episode. So with that said, what did you guys think of the episode? Do you guys think I'm crazy? For saying Embiid's going to win the MVP. Who do you guys think is going to be in the NBA Finals this year? I have Lakers versus Bucks um, with the Bucks winning the championship. Um, I apologize for the lack of episodes recently. Life has just been wild. Um, haven't had much time, but whenever I can, I promise I'm going to try to get some episodes out for you guys. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Peace out.